Hello, I'm here with Dr. Ed Jacobson. He's in uh, Connecticut. Oh, you're in Greenwich, right, Dr. Jacobson? Right. Uh, yes. Greenwich, Connecticut. Okay, and Dr. Jacobson is in a consortium of doctors that I have such admiration for because what he knows today, he did not learn in medical school. It means <laughs> that at one point in his career, he had an awakening that there was something different going on and he had to go back to school for, um, for, for uh, when you consider all the years that doctors put in going to med school, then to have to go back. But you, your specialty today, as I understand it, is individualized bioidentical hormones. Am I correct? Yeah, I know it's absolutely. broader than that. We'll get into that. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. So is your, is your practice predominantly female or predominantly male or half and half? It's mostly female and it's evolving into a male practice, primarily from the females that do so well and their husbands or partners say, I want what she's got. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they come into the office and they find it a little unusual to be at a gynecologist's office, but they get over it very quickly. <laughs> yes, well, um, I, that's, that's another component to who you are and what you do. Sure. Here is a gynecologist who understands, and I'm sure you understand after a woman has a baby, um, what goes off in a, in a female body after, after hormones. Do you find after a woman has a baby that very often uh, uh, that postpartum depression is really a that the body has not revved up producing progesterone yet and am, am i off in my thinking I, on that or am i close? I, don't, I don't know if you can make it as simplistic as that i think it's multifactorial uh, -huh. uh it's been about 14 years since i've delivered babies so i'm a lot <laughs> of, yeah there are many many factors uh, from underlying predisposition towards depression to uh social uh, situations help from the partner from the husband uh, economic issues, sleep deprivation. I don't think you can pin it on just one thing. Okay. So the years go by and your patient comes in probably 45, 50, 55 ish, right? Correct. Absolutely. And what's the, what's the first thing they say? They introduce themselves. <laughs> they, <laughs> and I would say, so what brings you here? Right? Uh -huh. I like to hear what people have to say. Um, we don't have a time limited practice, so people have an opportunity to speak uh, at length about what's on their mind. And in the course of conversation, what comes out as initial social interaction, we really find out what's going on, whether there are issues with depression, uh, sexual issues, hormonal menstrual issues, and so forth. When um, I lecture to women, uh, and I ask, how many of you sleep five hours or less each night? I, I find predominantly every hand goes up. What, what goes on in the human body that all of a sudden, what was a given? What was a natural that you'd go, into, go to bed, you know, like you, when you put your kids or grandkids to bed, you know they're going to sleep. We reach a certain age where we're all filled with anxiety about we hope we sleep. Mm. Um, what is the cause of that? Well, if you wanted to pin on one thing, I would think it'd be a deficiency in growth hormone as we get older. Mm -hmm. It has a bearing uh, on sleep. But there's so many other factors that are involved with that. Uh, physical health, stresses, how much is on your mind. Uh, do you have a need to go to the bathroom many times at night and then can't fall back to sleep? Uh, mm -hmm. So there, there are many different views on that. But from one biological standpoint, I think it's decrease in growth hormone as we get older. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I've um, been taking growth hormone now for probably 20 years. Uh, to me, it's just part of the symphony. But it is so misunderstood. I think it was um, I think it was Sylvester Stallone that got stopped at the airport because he had growth hormone. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. it's just part of the new anti-aging regimen. Why do you think it's so maligned? I really don't know. It does have a, a negative connotation. There's basically when thing when medications are used outside of their norm, uh, off-label medications, a lot of people have great reticence about uh, the safety of it, and it's easier to say no rather than say let's take a look at it. Fortunately, yeah. in, the last, in, fast, in the last couple of years, uh, more and more studies have been done confirming not only the safety but the magnificent benefits of growth hormone. By the way, Suzanne. I have not started growth hormone, but I will be shortly. <laughs> mm -hmm.
there's a there's a symphony in the human body. I'm sure you will agree. Sure. Absolutely. And all the hormones work together and talk to one another. So so often men will say to me, "Well, I take testosterone." And I go, "Anything else?" "No, no, no, I get it online." Uh, Right. What do you think of that kind of um, application? Well, I think, and deal, let's deal with women because they take more hormones than men, okay? It's very easy to compartmentalize how one takes medication, the hormone medications, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and so forth. But you're absolutely right. The body integrates it as it sees fit. And to take only one or two things is only partially addressing the problem. If you're looking for optimal health, whether an aside to feeling well, you really need to take the whole complement of hormones. Uh, for men, clearly testosterone, uh, DHEA, thyroid, certain so nutritional supplement, supplements, vitamin D. Uh, for women, add on progesterone and, uh, and estrogen. Um, but you have to look at it as, as a whole package and not just individual products that you're taking. And you do it as per lab work, or do you first uh, listen to what they say in that first initial consult of how bad they feel and kind of um, the, the first go around, let's try this amount and then we'll tweak after? No, I actually do both. Uh, I have both. a two-part consultation. Initially, a person comes in for about an hour consultation. I have to know what their, their concerns are. They have any fears of taking certain medications. Um, what their problems are, what their social interactions are, what do they do for stress, stress relief. And then they get some comprehensive uh, blood testing here in the office. They get some reading material to go home. And when the blood tests come back about a week later, they come back for the second half of the consultation, at which point we go over why they came initially, go over all the laboratory tests unrelated to hormone replacement, and then very specifically about the hormones to be replaced. And then I make a recommendation of how it should be done, and I have to see how they accept it or not. Is it something they want to do all together? They want to think about it. It's their decision. But it's not simply take this little patch of estrogen and progesterone, and I'll see you in a year. No. And um, for those of you who are listening to uh, Dr. Jacobson, is that a dreamy thought that you get to go to your doctor and he gives you time that he's going to sit there and listen to you. I, I think that's a huge part of, of hormone replacement. There was one doctor I interviewed in one of my earlier books, uh, Dr. Daniela Poneski, who's no longer with us. And I remember she said something to me that struck me. She said, I instruct my front office that when these women call, you be nice to them because by the time they found me, <laughs> they're in such bad shape and they need a lot of understanding. And in the three years when I was without hormones, which is what put me on this search, I'm an upbeat, happy person. I, I couldn't believe the difference in my attitude towards life and um, my relationships. I just felt kind of dead. Is that uh, typical of what people say to you? I hear the whole range, as you have heard the whole range. Uh, I get a lot of patients coming in who have been on different types of hormonal regimens. A lot of them have been on um, synthetic hormones, been very, very unhappy with it. The problem is most doctors don't want to talk to patients or don't have the time or inclination. They don't mm. pass it the knowledge. And it's much easier to pass them off. And that's you have to be available, I find, 24-7 for people when they call. With some, some, what I think may be some of the most minor issues is a major issue for them. And you have to listen. And that's all part of the program of taking uh, hormone replacement and having an optimal result. Why do you think they're not teaching um, proper natural hormone replacement in uh, medical school? I think it's a matter of, uh, of reading the medical literature. Mm -hmm. A big problem that I find is that not only patients don't know about hormone replacement and the safety and the benefits, but most physicians don't either. They get their information from the medical media, which is so terribly inc incorrect, as you well know. Uh, most of the studies are done with synthetic hormones, not bioidentical hormones. And most physicians and medical schools don't realize there's a, a tremendous amount of knowledge out there from well-constructed uh, occurrence randomized studies that clearly prove that not only the benefits, but how these hormones can back off the risk of 
breast cancer in some instances, uh, car- certainly cardiovascular disease and dementia. It's, uh, it's like a, a, you get a wow experience from a lot of people and they say, this can't be true. But the mm-hmm. beauty of practicing medicine with evidence-based medicine is that you can refer to the medical literature. It's all there. There are two, th- there's something you just mentioned. There are two, two um, things that come up all the time when uh, people talk to me about uh, bioidentical hormones and where can I find a good doctor. But they're always afraid of this. I, don't, I haven't taken them because I don't want to get cancer. And I haven't taken them because I don't want to get fat. Could you um, help dispel that myth? Sure, we'll take number two first. Okay, I want to get the fat. Started. That's probably what, what <laughs> women fear more than even cancer. So I'm just joking. <laughs> I recently had somebody come in who said, I don't want to put on one ounce of fat. And I'm telling you all the benefits. And then I said, and I'll make your skin look great and just sign me up. <laughs> in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But I tell yeah, people. If you just told them this, you take bioidentical hormones, just tell them this, and your breasts will get perkier. That's like a, a one that people go, really? Okay. Yeah. I, I can't say that to my team. You can say that, I can't say that. <laughs> okay, I put it in the I, cross. That cross is a line. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but first of all, I tell people when they go through menopause, there's always that 10 pound weight gain, right? That's yeah. unfortunately a given. You, in there. You know what you do. Secondly, I tell them if they put on weight with bioidentical hormones, it's water weight, it's salt retention and responds to a diuretic for a variable period of time. Mm-hmm. I said, and if they don't believe me, I'll give them diuretics for four or five days, they'll lose eight to 10 pounds and say, voila. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, it, it, uh, it, pan, it works itself out, but it is not caloric weight gain. If anything, especially with uh, testosterone and with thyroid, there can be significant weight loss, as you know. Right. Yes. Yes, I know. And I, that's an interesting thing to say, because it is about a 10 pound gain. Once the, that's what that's your first alert when your hormones are off. Um, I, 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 you know, coined that phrase, the seven dwarves of menopause, itchy, bitchy, sleepy, sweaty, bloated, forgetful and all dried up. <laughs> but those are the symptoms. And mm-hmm. uh, do you encourage your patients to call with something that s- seems as meaningless as my leg itches? First of all, I try to explain all of the symptoms that I can possibly conceive of when somebody goes on hormone replacement therapy. Because if they hear it from me up front, they're less apt to say, that's a problem, I ought to call. But I get people calling with rashes and itching and so forth. And you just got to be patient and reassure. And that's all that people want, just reassurance yeah. from somebody who responds yeah. very, very quickly by telephone. Not uh, email yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, that was one of my first uh, menopausal symptoms, a, a li- an itch on my leg that could drive you mad. It just, mm-hmm. it, you could scratch until you were bleeding. And I remember calling my doctor at the time. I said, I feel stupid calling you because I have an itch. She says, well, she took me seriously. She said, what have your stresses been lately? And then she started the alchemy. <laughs> and that's, that's the art Right. Of, of hormone replacement, isn't it? Absolutely. Let me go to your second question, or the okay. first question. Okay. And that is, Doctor, I'm so scared of getting breast cancer of taking right. hormone replacement therapy. And that is probably the main concern of most women coming in. And I have to ask them, what, what is their concern? Where, do they, where, does, it, where does this come from? And inevitably, uh, invariably, excuse me, it comes from uh, the Women's Health Initiative study of a decade ago. Right. And I explained to them uh, basically that it's, uh, it's an observational study about the faults of the study. I showed them that some legs of the study show no association uh, with breast cancer. And in fact, there's even some evidence that it may reduce breast cancer. And then I point out what the differences between a, a randomized study, a controlled study versus a study that just shows association. And I give them, I give them the references of all the half a dozen or so well-known international studies that have shown that estrogen replacement is not associated with breast cancer, uh, along with uh, cardiovascular protection and dementia protection as well. So by giving that information, uh, I think it's very, very helpful. Very few people decide not to take hormone replacement therapy. And I also tell them that I have at least 10 to 15 breast cancer survivors on complete hormone retention. Uh, or, or, excuse me, hormone replacement therapy for cardiovascular uh, protection. 
and and that would be me. Uh, I have yeah. been on hormone mm -hmm. replacement for 20 years. The, um, the also that Women's Health Initiative study was done on synthetic hormones, which are not there's nothing compatible to the female human hormones, but also. Um, it was a 10 year study. They stopped after two years and I'm paraphrasing uh, women would be better off to take nothing at all than to take these dangerous, harmful, and even fatal hormones. And that was like mm -hmm. information that got out there and it was so um, disconnected from the, the full body of the information mm -hmm. that all women went, well, I don't want breast cancer. And women even threw away their synthetic hormones and then started gaining weight and um, getting unhappy. I, I feel because in as a gynecologist and a hormone specialist, um, part of your work also must be psychologist because you're dealing with emotions and hormones are such a big part of emotions. Um, do you have a, a lot of anxiety in your patients that you have to deal with? I do. And a lot of the anxiety, I think, can be dealt with by just speaking things out, either to a psychologist or to their partner. Uh, from a biochemical standpoint, there are certain medications like pregnenolone, magnesium, SAMI, and so forth, all of which are available to people. Oxytocin is wonderful for anxiety. Wonderful. <laughs> Pardon me? Oxytocin is wonderful. Oh, you <laughs> you want to be happy. <laughs> and everybody thinks it's just for sexual arousal. No way. It's wonderful for no. you twice a day. And uh, overall, just it's just it's another hormone that we uh, decline in or stop making completely. Um, it, I feel we're living in a lucky time. We've. Uh, through technology, we've been able to extend life through MRIs and CAT scans, sophisticated blood tests, uh, antibiotics, even sewage, all these things have extended life. But when most people look at the present paradigm of aging, it's something that we don't want any part of because it's decrepit and frail and, and um, sadly so often ending up in that awful place of either a heart disease cancer or Alzheimer's and then the nursing home. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that with proper hormone replacement, and when I say proper, I mean the kind that you do, where it's her lab consultation and lab work. So you see exactly what this person's deficiencies are. And a change in diet and, and a lessening of the um, environmental assault. You think we now have a chance to take advantage of this long life with quality? That's a difficult question to answer. Your quality of life will certainly be extended, but we had, there's no data to show how people who are on ideal levels of replacement therapy have a, live in an excellent environment, their diet is perfectly fine. When they get to be 85, 95, 100, are they gonna drop off the edge? Are they going to just slide off peacefully? We have no idea. It remains to be seen, right? can't yeah. think of any reason why not to continue on because we all know what the downside is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you and I, um, I think we'll get to that place and be able to um, comment yeah. about it. You know, I, I um, went back to work last year as a um, Vegas performer just because I love it. And also because I wanted to show at 70 years old, you still have your juice and you can still do it and you, and I, I don't have any aches or pains or anything, which is just so wonderful. And I remember walking back to the, um, our hotel room after the show one night, and I said to my husband, I would love to be doing this when I'm 80 years old. I'd love to still be out on that stage. I, I feel we've got a shot at that, don't you, by this new approach to aging? I don't mean everybody's going to be on a Vegas stage, but I mean having energy and vitality. <laughs> I think <laughs> of course, like, if you want to be on a biggest stage, you do it. <laughs> but who would come? <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I will, I promise. <laughs> you know, I, just, I just read an article in the local newspaper not too long ago of a fellow who is on uh, leave from, uh, replacement therapy, 85 years of age, just completed a marathon. And wow. he didn't finish last. So wow. yeah, I think we have great opportunities ahead of us. Absolutely. 
I, um, one of the tragedies that I observe in my peers, who are all in their 70s and 80s now, is um, being on so many pharmaceutical drugs that they can't think anymore. And the tragedy I'm talking about is the loss of our wisdom pool. What you have to offer, what I have to offer is the one thing that no young person can buy or have, and that is wisdom and perspective. And what does the world need more of right now? So there must be a sense when you go home every night, a spring in your step that you are uh, contributing to the wisdom pool by making your parent, uh, patient so well and that you are dealing with primarily happy patients, I would imagine. Am I correct? Absolutely. Um, it's, you can sum it all up in, in one word, and it's passion. It's, passion. You really get a tremendous amount of, of great feeling from patients who you see you helped people you've taken off of what I feel are harmful medications that their doctors have put them on for hormonal relief or for co uh, cholesterol uh, control and a lot of cardiac medications and uh, who've been had their told not to take estrogen because it's dangerous and in fact they come off they come off their medications after being on estrogen uh, the biggest challenge I think is with my peers in the medical community because I don't receive many referrals from medical doctors. <laughs> I get, but I don't need referrals from medical doctors. I have patients who self-refer, and that's the most gratifying. Well, when uh, you know the, the thing about women is when we when we find something good, we tell at least ten girlfriends always, <laughs> and so that's your grassroots movement there. Um, there's a doctor in town here in Greenwich that can give you your life back and make you feel good. Because I'm not anti-pharmaceutical at all. When you need them, you need them and they're a godsend. But I, at this point, do not require one pharmaceutical, nor do I take any over the counter. Because there are other ways to deal with headaches and things like that. Um, do you feel that by minimizing foreign molecules being brought into the body in the form of over-the-counter drugs or pharmaceutical drugs or, or just what you're cleaning your house with um, can be a big asset by eliminating as much as you can in terms of your gut health and your brain health and your overall uh, balance in your body? Sure. Look, we deal with bioidentical hormones, so the body sees it as normal and it has a mm -hmm. means of processing it and detoxifying and eliminating it. And anything else doesn't fall into that category, whether it's a prescribed pharmaceutical or it's a pesticide or a house cleaning medication, these things can't possibly be good. I think your body does a fantastic job of dealing with this onslaught until eventually it breaks down and there's too much damage to the gut, for example, and there's too much leakage of bacteria which causes chronic inflammation. But uh, unless it's, uh, the body recognizes it as self, it's not going to be that helpful. I find that uh, menopausal women drink a lot of white wine. I, I was doing it myself when I was in my three terrible years. And when I see women out for lunch and they're all drinking wine, I get it because uh, it's probably the only time of the day they feel good, takes the edge off. But that's a lot of sugar and a lot of yeast. And uh, can you talk to me about, is there, I mean, it's okay to have a cocktail now and then, but is there any um, thing that you could say to women who are drinking uh, excessive amounts of white wine that there might be a better way for them to go? Well, the first step down is red wine. You get your resveratrol <laughs> and you you know, nearly as much sugar and you get your alcohol. <laughs> you know, that's true. You don't drink as much red wine because it doesn't have the sugars. You don't have the, the yeah. craving thing. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. But, but the other thing so, is we, we know now that, of course, that sugar is the main culprit, uh, not, not uh, cholesterol. And any source of sugar should really be limited as much as possible to maintain your quality of life and your love of life, uh, but in moderation because sugar is going to do you in. I agree with you, and it's so benign. It's so easy to get into that addictive thing. You know, the, the time you know, why'd I eat the whole box? 
because the brain's going, I didn't quite get what I need for um, building cells. Can we give me a little more? I, I, I think that um, the sugar message is huge because women are so concerned about their weight. Give up sugar and give up uh, gluten and uh, grains as, as much as you can in a high protein, high fat, high vegetable diet. You sure can get your figure back in conjunction with uh, bioidentical hormones. And uh, in the end, if we are hormonally balanced and we've got our juice and we've got our libido, we'd also like to look good. And um, this is for those of you who are watching, Dr. Jacobson is the kind of doctor you've been looking for because you're going to get information from him and answers from him that you're not going to get elsewhere because he has taken the time to step out of the standard of care box to try a different way. He has taken the time to understand a new way to approach life in this millennium, which is unlike anything humanity's ever experienced. If um, you had one last thing that you wanted to say to people listening about what could happen in their life that would, uh, by coming to you, that would make their life better, what would you say to them? I would say that if they're unhappy with the way they look or feel, that's just the surface of it. If they have family history of cardiovascular disease, dementia, and you know how devastating that could be, you can do something about it. That's the beauty of replacing hormones. You can do something about it to improve the quality of life. There's no such thing as anti-aging. You just want to be able to age more gracefully and enjoy every day of your life. Yes, and not be not be sick. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, you and I are somewhere in the same age range. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm probably older than you, but um, <laughs> when you and I were kids, people just died of old age. They didn't die sick. And I think that's a new goal. That's essentially what you just said. Uh, when when it's over, it's over. But get there well. And this is the greatest way I know of getting there well. I so appreciate your time. And what I've also noticed, for those of you who are listening to this podcast, this is a nice guy. This is a nice guy. He's um, not preachy or lecturous. He knows his stuff. And um, you'll have a good time with them to boot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure speaking with you, Suzanne. You too, Ed. Thanks so much. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Bye -bye. <laughs>